Well, this week on Auto Insiders with Ray Shevsky, I have a special guest, David Langle. David started as a porter in the car business, and, well, he was foolish enough to stay in the car business and, and learn all about service, learn about parts, learn about fixed stops, learn about running a dealership, and, well, I'm pretty sure he's got a story or two that he'll be able to share with us today. David, welcome. How good. are you today? Good, good, Ray. Good. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it's it. My, it's my pleasure. I I always love, and don't, don't tell anybody this, but I always love talking to car people because, well, hopefully you'll confirm what I'm about to say. People who spend an inordinate amount of time in the car business, and I believe you spent 38 years. I was in it for 43 right. years. Um, they're special kind of people. And I, I don't mean like they rode the short bus to school. I mean that it just takes a special type of person to be involved in the retail automobile business um, for as many years as you've done it or I did it. Correct. Uh, it, it, you know, especially for a single person, because uh, let's be honest, it, it, it destroys your family in some way, form or another. Oh, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I've had two wives, one passed away and, and one yeah. divorced my ass. Um, and, 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 and the reason was because, well, I was never home. You know, Correct. I was always working. Um, Correct. When, when I first started in the business in 1977, you know, it was on the East Coast. The stores opened at, at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, and they closed at 9 o'clock at night. And, Correct. well, you were expected to be there from 9 in the morning till 9 at night. You, you know, you got Sunday off, and you had another day off during the week. But otherwise, you were working 12, 13, 14-hour days. Well, Correct. That doesn't leave any time for anyone else in your life. Absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, um, I, you know, when I got into it, I, I actually got a, a degree in criminal law, but okay. um, I, I broke my leg and they're in the police academy. And I said, you know, I, I'm a car enthusiast. So obviously we want to be around cars all day. Sure. Um, and, and I got into it. I knew the more socks. And uh, I thank them for it because honestly, I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I, I, it, 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 you got to be a people person, as you know, or it's oh, just absolutely. not the job for you. Yeah, absolutely. You have to. Not only do you have to be a people person, but you you have to be able to be like a duck in a sense, in where you just let stuff roll off your back. Because if Correct. you took if you took everything people say to you personally, um, well, every one of us would be mass murderers. Um, Correct. Yeah, it, it, it is unbelievable uh, some of the stuff that we would hear or that you'd have to put up with. Now, if I remember correctly, you told me you started with the Morse organization in uh, 1986, was it, as a Nine, porter? As a porter. Wow. Car can use, use cars. And uh, I did that for about a year. They saw I was, you know, worthy. And um, then I became, uh, they wanted me to go do parts. Okay. So obviously okay. driving parts, delivering parts, stocking parts. Um, then I did that for about three years. Then I became okay. assistant parts manager. So, um, and I skipped the counter person at all. So I said, eh, let me work the counter first because, you know, and, and you know, as I know, working the parts counter, the back counter is the worst because that's the tech. Yes. And, and, and they're your favorite customer, as we all, or you and me would know that, not a customer would know that. Yes. So I, 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 I took the delay of becoming a assistant parts manager and worked the back counter for four years. Um, and, can I ask you a silly question? Did, yes. During that time, did you find yourself, uh, I don't know, when you were dreaming, you would dream skew numbers? I looked in books. They don't have that now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we had books back then, right? Wow. Now, yeah, well. now, you know, kids can look in a computer. Anyone can look in a computer. Yes. But, uh, yes. Um, you know, I did that. And uh, then I became assistant manager, parts manager, service director, service manager, and became fixed ops. 
I, I, did, I enjoyed it. Did you ever, did, did, did you work as a service advisor at all? Yes, I did that for a year. And okay. I feel, I, I, I envy a service advisor because that, that's a tough job. It really is. Well, <laughs> yes. And one of the reasons, at least in my mind, correct me if I'm wrong, because I never, I never worked the back end. I never worked right. parts and service. I was one right. of their best customers, but I never worked in those departments. Right. And I, but I would think as a service advisor that that's got to be one of the toughest jobs in the dealership because typically when, when you get to see a customer, there's a problem with their car and they're not happy. Absolutely. Yeah. Otherwise they wouldn't be, they're not stopping by to have a cup of coffee with you. No. <laughs> and they want it now. They want it now. Yes. And, and, and back then, you know, there was no loaner cars, you know, dealers give loaners today. We didn't have that. Yeah. So you, you, you're their first point of contact. You have to yes. put yourself in their shoes, even though you don't want to, but um, you have to make a bad situation, a good situation for the customer. Yes. And that's the job of a service writer. And and what did what did you think was the best way to go about doing that, especially back then, before service loaners? I always told the customer, I will, you know, I will definitely keep you um, a rise of the situation. I try to get them a ride home. You okay. Know, the worst thing to do, even in today's dealers, is to have a customer sitting in a waiting room discussing their problem with 30 other customers and, and you know, yes. that doesn't mix. Yes. No. So you want to get them, you want to get them a ride home and you have to keep up with your technicians to make sure that yes, this is an alternator going bad and you have to communicate that with the customer. And, and can you explain to the audience because the audience knows mostly the sales side of things from, well, me uh, for over these years. Um, can you explain to them the, the, the level and lines of communication that are so important to a service advisor? I mean, the first thing you said before is, well, you, you have to keep them apprised of what's going on. And, and, and that might mean, at least in my world, if I said to a customer, I'll call you by four o'clock to let you know what I found out. And even at four o'clock, if I hadn't been able to find anything out, I would still call the customer at four o'clock just to say, I've been working on it. I still don't have an answer, but I promised you that I'd call you at four to, to give you an update. So I'm, right. I'm living up to my, is, is that something that you encourage service writers to do? Uh, absolutely. I, I always told my service writers, try to get the car in there because we did work on appointments back then. Sure. Try to get the car, car in there. And try to let me know, A, I, I'm working on it. I have a result. We found out the problem. Let's get to parts. Let's find the price on the part, availability in the part. Then once you have all the pieces of the puzzle, then you call the customer. You don't want to call them premature and say, oh, we think it's the alternator. Um, yes. I'll call you yes. back with another price. Because as you know, that that's your... your Yes, we want to check the car out, but we don't want to oversell. Exactly. Because, correct. And, and, and the lines of, I mean, as a service advisor, you have to have conversations with the customer. Correct. You have to have conversations with your tech. You have, at, or, you know, how, however many techs are assigned to a particular service advisor. You have correct. to have conversations with your parts personnel, whether it be the Correct. parts manager or parts counterperson, oftentimes Correct. you might even have to have a conversation with um, the service manager himself or even the general manager of the dealership. I mean, that's a lot of people that you have to have open lines of communications with. Right. And remember, an average service writer gets about 14 to 16 cars and customers a day. Yes. So you're doing that a lot. Yes. So, so if you can explain how time consuming that is. And, and if, if I, if I remember correctly from my days 
at the mini store. Our service advisors used to get in, I don't know, 7, 30, 8 o'clock. And you know what? They were still there at, at 7 o'clock at night. Correct. Now, the techs had gone home at 5, you know, but the service advisors, <laughs> I mean, their day's incredibly long. Yeah, uh, you know, from 7 in the morning, the cars get lined up. You take in, you know, eight, nine cars at 7 in the morning, and then, you remember, you got appointments booked at least till 1 o'clock. Yes. So you want to get those in the service, dispatch, because there's a dispatcher. From from the writer, it goes to the dispatcher. The dispatcher yes. dispatches it to the correct tech uh, transmission. You know, uh, light duty, heavy duty, heavy duty to engine yes. transmission. Light duty could be uh, a door lock actuator or an alternator. Then the techs have to manage their time as well because they don't just have one car; they got seven no. cars now. Yes. So it, it, it's. I have to be a micromanager, is if that's what you would call it. Yes. To micromanage my techs because usually you have five to six techs per writer, so okay. you're their boss intentionally, um, and, and they communicate with you. Then you communicate with the customer, the service manager, internal use car manager. So it, it, it's a system. It still works today. I, you know, I, I think it's pretty much the same system that was around when I started in the car business in 1977. It really hasn't changed all that Correct. much. I mean, a lot of it might be computerized today, but Correct. Correct. still it is, it is a, and when I say labor intensive, I mean, labor intensive in the sense that, that you have so many people you have to communicate with as a service Correct. advisor that, Correct. that, that, how they keep track of everything, it's always amazed me. I I, I think they are some, personally, I, I think service advisors are some of the most valuable employees in a in a uh, automobile dealership. I, because, I agree. Because if they don't do their job well, whatever, whatever rapport the, the sales department was able to establish and build with a customer to get them to say yes, oh. a oh. bad service advisor can destroy that in a matter of minutes. Absolutely. Mm. You know, another scenario is, you know, a transmission. Yes. You may know the car's in there for at least a week. A part-time back order. Now you got a, now you got a, a, an upset customer. What are you going to do? We don't make the part. Yes. So yeah. you have to keep in contact with that customer, especially every morning. Mr. Customer, the part is supposed to be here tomorrow, and my damn, you got to call them. And, and yes. if you don't, if you don't call them, guess where they end up? In the GM. Oh, well, the, yes, absolutely. And the GM is going to come and visit oh, um, yes. because he's going to want to know why the conversation that was promised to take place didn't take right. place. Correct. Um, correct. In the busiest service department that you ran, what was what was a typical number of of uh, of shop tickets you would run in a day? Internal or customer? Both combined. Uh, we did about twenty five internals, and okay. uh, we had we had four service riders, ten to thirteen cars a day per service rider. Quite a bit. Yeah, that is. Yeah. That's that's like sixty tickets a day, right? Sixty to seventy, and, and you know you always get the oh my god, I got to have this used car done right now. Stop what of you're course. doing. Yes, of course. No, that that that's a given because yeah, right. you know this the sales department. I'm, I'm going to say this in in as nice a way as I can. The sales department is like a pig, and yeah. and he just thinks that whatever his department is doing is much more important than anything oh. you could be doing. And, Correct. and you should, and you should drop everything just for either Correct. that new car manager or that used car manager. Correct. And let's, let's be honest. I want to let the audience know used cars pays the same as a customer, uh, customer pay. They don't yes. get no deals. Yes. Uh, you know, so I understand their situation too. They're paying the same as a customer. 
yes, no, and I get that, and and but that doesn't and 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 they were typically probably your, your best customer. Um, Correct. O- overall, they spent more than any of your other customers. Um, Correct. But, but still, they were they were just a customer, and, and Correct. it's hard to get a used car manager to understand that. Still today, still today. Yes. No, I, and, trust me, I and, still have those conversations. And, and then you know, I used to handle most of the internals, so I would I had a good relationship with the used car manager, and okay. and and um, I, I most I I would I have the authorization for a thousand dollar check on every car, okay. but I didn't abuse that because we all know where that gets you. Yeah. And Can, and you know and you know four tires is more than a thousand dollars. You know that. Can can you can you do me one small kindness and can you explain to the audience when when you say internal, I know what you mean. Uh, the audience, because they haven't spent forty years in the car business, they have no idea what you're talking about. So when we say an internal ticket, can you explain to the audience what that means? So an internal ticket could be a new car or used car that has a we owe, which means the customer was owed a bedliner for a pickup truck and they have to come back after the sale. And yes, pick it that's up, yeah. still right. Yes, that is considered an internal, even though it is a yes. sold customer unit. So internal would be used cars, new cars, auction cars. Um, and we consider that internal, meaning the dealership inside. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for explaining right. that. Because Correct. And, 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 and most dealerships are set up so that the internal customers, the used car department, the new car department, pay exactly the same for the service as, well, the external customer, the normal customer that would come into a dealership. We, we wouldn't get it. And, and you said something a moment ago, you know, where you, you were authorized, you could, you could spend up to a thousand dollars on a used car without having to check with the used car manager. And that, Correct. that takes um, having a great relationship with a used car manager to be able to be in that position. Correct. But you said, you know, you- tires, four tires could be more than a thousand dollars. One of Correct. my major complaints when I was at the, at the mini store at our mini store is every time the tech would say, well, it needs tires, okay, the the service manager would always approve um, the factory replacement tires. So if it had Continentals on it when it came in right. as a used car and it needed tires, they were going to put Continentals on it again, even right. though they might have been Forty, fifty dollars a tire more expensive than a comparable tire, and and I used to explain to the try to explain to the techs and to the service manager that when you say it needs new tires, look at it as if it was your car that you were selling, and do you want to put the most expensive tires on it you can, or do you want to put good quality tires on it that are less expensive so that you could either sell it for lesser or maybe improve your profit when you do sell it. Right. And and if, if the answer was, well, I, I would want to spend the less amount of money, I said, well, then do the same for me. Extend that right. same courtesy. To me. I, I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, my, my, my pet peeve was, uh, you know, let's take a certified pre-owned car that the factory considers pre-owned, but new standards. Yes. You have, you, you, if a car comes from the auction, which means a used car manager buys it online or in person, it could be a loose yes. return. If that car comes in and it has two continentals and two Bridgestones on it, you are not allowed to sell a certified pre-owned car with different brand tires on it. Exactly. So now I got to go back to use car made and say, well, you got to put four new tires on it. Oh, no, no, no. These tires are brand new. You have to follow protocol. And my protocol is I'm going to marry that customer, not the used car manager. Yes. I want it done right. 
Right. So either do it right or don't do it at all. When 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 you made this switch from the service department and and you became a general manager of a dealership, what did you find was the 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 hardest thing to communicate to the team that you really are one, not not four separate departments. You're not the new new and used car department. Right. You're not finance and insurance. It's right. not parts, and it's not. It's you're all in this together. Right. Well, how how did you communicate that to your entire team? I communicated that I had an open door policy. Uh, you know, we all know that you and me know at least that parts and service never got along. That was the quote unquote thing. Yes. My dealerships got along because we all communicated. We broke bread once a week together. We had breakfast. We communicated. I want to know the problems. I do not want to find the problems when they happen. Yes. You know, no one's perfect. We know that. And the communication is open. And as also having your correct team on your side. Um, you, you got to have a good team that's happy uh, and, and, and can produce some good customers and make some money for the dealership. Yeah, because part of, part of my job as a new car manager was to make as, as many potential new customers for the service department on a monthly basis as I possibly could. Um, Correct. You know, it wasn't just to sell the car. If I sold right. 100 new cars, well, 70 of those customers very well could end up being your customer, could be the store's right. customer. And so it was always more than just the sale of things. I remember right. when when I worked for the Penske organization and I was the new car manager at Acura North Scottsdale. And we had a general manager come in. And mm -hmm. at that time... You know, parts and service and sales didn't necessarily get along. And right. so they came up with a pay plan that we all got paid on what everybody else did. So if parts and service did better, Ray did better. If of sales course. did better, my parts and service managers did better. Um, I made sure that new cars were accessorized because sure. I wanted, I wanted their accessory penetration to go up. Of course. Um, I got paid off of it and I never on the sales side of it, after I had accessorized it, I would never have the nerve to go back to parts or service and say, can I give this part back? I, I, you know, I bought it. I own it. If, if that's keeping me from selling the car, how about I just give it to the customer? <laughs> Write it off. Cost of sale. Exactly. Um, you know, and, and when we operated like it was, it was amazing right. how we, every one of us cared about what every department did. Um, right. Yeah. I, I, I shared a story, um, and I don't remember which, which broadcast it was on, where when I was at, at our Acura North Scottsdale store, our service department had an issue in the mornings mm -hmm. where, according to service CSI, the customers just felt like they weren't being, being waited on quickly enough. Right. Which is, you know, a normal complaint. You have four service writers. Everybody seems to come in at the same time. How right. many people can you handle? And right. and, and everyone's in a hurry. Of course. And <laughs> and and I remember, you know, the service manager. I don't know what to do. He says, "Not." I said, "Well, when are you busiest?" He goes, "From eight to 10. You right. know, that's when we're the busiest. And, right. and he said, I can't just hire somebody to come in two hours a day. That's, you know, right. that doesn't right. work. And, and I thought to myself, well, the sales department gets in at eight, you know, three salespeople or four salespeople and one sales manager, they get in at eight. Right. Um, in all the years I've been doing this, we have never once sold and delivered a car between the hours of eight and nine. Um, 
and very rarely between the hours of nine and 10 uh, wow. in the morning. So I said, well, what, what would happen if the opening sales manager and the sales staff that came in worked the service drive with you in the morning and we greeted your customers? Right. Well, we had some of the highest customer satisfaction scores for service in the nation because everybody felt like they were greeted in, in, in a timely manner because they were. Uh, and we would entertain them until one of the four service advisors could break free and actually right. write up their ticket. Right. Did did you did you have situations like that in your store where everybody pitched in to help? Yeah, they they I suggested that they would have a service or a sales consultant okay. out on the drive. Um, we didn't like that because you all know what happens with that. Well, you know, this the sales consultant wants to sell a car. Correct. So <laughs> yeah. your 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 twenty two hundred dollar service ticket yeah. goes yeah. gets flipped to internal. But yeah, everyone wins at the end of the day is what I the way I look at it. Yeah, you may have not made that day pretty good on your side, but you got that customer for another three four years, right? And, and you know, if that was a customer was coming into the service department already and, right. and you're able to flip them into another new car or used right. car, right. Uh, well, the likelihood is they're going to remain your service customer going forward. Right. Um, right. You, but when we were doing we weren't doing it with the hopes of finding some sale in the morning. We were just right. literally... It, it was it was great camaraderie between the sales manager and the sales crew that was on in the morning because we could right. we could have conversations about what we needed to do. We could greet the they were our customers. Correct. I mean, we knew most of the customers because we had sold them the damn car, so right, it kept, right. kept us in front of them. Correct. We helped we helped the service department. It, it just it seemed to me I don't know why it took me. Th probably 35 years to figure that out that, that, you know, that's what we should do in the mornings, but. You know, let, let me tell you. Yeah, absolutely. Let me tell you a story. What, uh, let me ask you a question first. Okay. What person in the dealership can sell a new or let's say new right now, a new yes. car better than, yeah. a, better than a salesman. Uh, a tech. A tech or the service advisor. Absolutely. Or parts. Or parts, yes. correct? Yeah. Right. Why? Because they know every damn thing about the vehicles. Correct. I could not tell you how many times, because, you know, being in fixed stops, I had to walk the dealer. I was in charge uh -huh. of fixed and internal. I walked in the side of this new car showroom, and I sold the car. Because I knew more than half of the damn salesmen know. Well, and it's a shame. Well, that's the, the, I'm going to put this as nicely as I can. That's because too many of the salespeople are just lazy. Um, and, right. and they don't want to learn this stuff. Um, right. So, so yeah. Did, did you, here's, here's something that I, I instituted at the Acura store. <clears throat> One of the things that, I hated as the salesman, as a sales manager, as the new car mm -hmm. manager, was that after the customer bought a car, they would right. get a letter or an email from the service director letting them know that if there were any parts or accessories that they would like to get for their car, they could get a 10 or 15% discount, whatever it was. Correct. And I hated that because it made it harder for me to sell accessories at, at the time of sale. Right. So I went to my parts manager and I said, what if, what if at the time of sale, we say, pick out whatever accessories you want and you can get 10 to 15% off of those today. Right. And then the letter that goes out after they've purchased the cars, hey, thank you very much for being a, a part of our our community now, that we're here for you. And and not offer them a discount after the fact, because you're rewarding them after the fact when we should have rewarded them at the time. Correct, correct. Well, the, you, you know, 
the, the enticement of getting a new car, the, the majority of customers will buy the accessories now, not after they get their payment. Yes. You know, I always insisted that I know you're going to, you're going to say, if we could get every salesman to do that, to walk them before that customer leaves to every single department there is. Absolutely. You, yes. you still can't get salesmen today to do that. No, no. To do a tour of the facility, to, uh, to walk them out to the service drive, to introduce them to service advisors, right. to show them the shop, to show them where the parts department is, right. introduce them to the people that work in those departments. Yeah, right. that, is like, that is like pulling teeth to get salespeople and, to do that. And, and you know that parts and service personnel almost never change. Never. Oh, no. They're there forever. Correct. So yes. I, I, I always insist that that get done. And still, you know, I'm a car enthusiast. I buy a lot of cars. You saw my emails. And they just give you the key. Goodbye. Yeah. Now, I don't care because I know about cars. But sure, they don't understand that's a lost sale somewhere. It is all about building a relationship. Correct. With with that customer. Okay. Right. And if if you want to build the relationship, even if even if you don't care about the customer, right. if you pretend that you care about the right. customer, that'll right. mean everything to the customer. And ultimately, even if you're pretending, in reality you really are caring. Well, yeah, because it's feeding you. It's feeding your family, correct? Eventually. Yeah, they're the ones that put the food on our table. Correct. Uh, yes. You know, and, and, and I don't understand why that still insists today. I just don't get it. Um, because I, I think, and I, and I don't really mean this in as negative a way as it might sound, but I think that, so many salespeople are are lazy and take shortcuts and they don't see the big picture of right. spending a little extra time of really developing that relationship so that I mean I used to tell my salespeople what you want to become is their car guy or gal right. okay right. and if they ever need a car even if it's not a brand that we carry tell them you want them to contact you because you might know somebody somewhere that can help them Correct. that solidifies you as their car person right. that's what you're trying to establish right. when and I'm sure you saw it. I mean, salespeople would say, well, I'm going to move to the other, to, to our competitor. Why? Well, because, you know, they're busier or the grass is always greener somewhere. It's Never. The same, same it's shit. the same damn, it's the same damn grass. Okay. Yeah. And the key to success, I used to tell them, is you stay in one place. You build right. a book of business so right. that five years in, you're not, waiting around for somebody to come in the door as a fresh right. opportunity. You've right. already got appointments lined up with your customers from three, four, five years ago who right. you've made that relationship with who are coming back to see you. And right. they're the easiest people to sell a car to. It's called retention. Yes. And, yes. And, and, you know, I, it, you know, I worked for Southeast Toyota for the, my last seven years. Okay. And, and um, you're familiar with Southeast Toyota because you always talk about yes. them, Jim Moran. And yes. I actually yes. had the opportunity to work for Jim Moran back at J.M. Okay. Pontiac in Hollywood okay. uh, during my time as well. So um, tough company, I have to tell you. Yeah. You think what? They, I, I, I think I was in Jacksonville in their, you know, uh, at their their port if people don't understand yeah. that's that's the port that all the toyotas come to before they hit the dealers gotcha i was i was probably there 60 percent of my time in meetings than actual really? in the store yeah wow um, and still today they really want 
you to make sure you know your stuff. They're they're a tough cookie. Um. Yeah, but they've been pretty successful. Still. Yes. Still. Yes. <laughs> you know. You know. Let's face it. When they drop the car for the dealer, they're paid. Miss Moran's paid. Period. Absolutely. Um, you know, and that's what a lot of people forget that for the automobile manufacturers, the customer isn't the retail customer. The customer Correct. is the dealership. Correct. That's their customer. And then yeah. once we at the dealership sell that car, well, then we're going to start costing the manufacturer money again because that's when the warranty kicks in. Correct. Yeah. Or a floor plan or, or you know, it, 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 I enjoyed it. Um, another, another funny point was, was we had a new used car manager come in um, because we all know there, there aren't honest used car managers or new car managers or service managers out there in the world. We know that. Of course. So I used to always in my store load up, most of the trucks, because we all know okay. trucks sell. So we yes. would put OEM, which is original manufactured accessory wheels, tires, uh, side steps that you know people are going to buy anyways. Yes. Why not buy them when they buy the car? Because we know exactly. that that's more successful at the time of purchase. So I remember, you know, I used to load up six or seven trucks and I had the authorization to do that. Oh, you know, then we, two days later, oh, I need to talk to you right now. You need to get all the stuff off this truck. I says, for what? You own that stuff when I, when I put it on that truck. <laughs> oh, no, we're, dealer, we're, we're going to dealer trade it to a store 200 miles away. And I said, my friend, you better put that on the, 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 the dealer trade. You own those accessories. Yeah, I, you, you know, just make the dealer aware of it, that, that it was accessorized. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, you're going to take all those accessories off. The technician's going to get paid again because, he, you know, he's not going to do that for free. Yeah. You're going to be half of the bill the accessories cost internal. I, I mean, really? I, I um, enjoyed that. That, that, was, that was funny. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, not not to defend new car managers and sales managers, um, but they don't like to pay for stuff. I mean, uh, I'll just know. tell you that. I, I, yeah. I, I know that. It could be a $2 storage card. Take it off. Yes. I, you know, and, it, and it's like... I, I know I would have to explain the customer would say to me, well, we'll take it. I said, I can take it off, but here's the problem. I paid labor to put it on. Right. Right. I'm going to have to pay the labor to take it off. Those costs don't go away. No. What goes away is the part that you want me to take right. off, but right. I can't save you the whole price of that part because there's the labor that you and I right. are both going to pay for. Right, oh. right. Either, yeah, you know, either cost of sale, and, and you, you know, you you hate that number, and neither do I, because you know, service and parts have cost of sale too. It's in every department. I I right. once had a a customer on an MDX, and we had put body side moldings on it, and I forget what we charged. Maybe it was two ninety nine for the body side moldings, and oh. the customers. I'm not paying for that. I, I get it, but you know, this the, these actually provide some service to you and have some value. Right. Right, right, right. And and I said, here's what I'll do. I you pay for half and I'll pay for the other half. And I, I said, cost. yeah. So I'll uh, I'll sell you you can have them for a hundred and fifty dollars instead of the three hundred dollars. But here's the deal. The first time someone opens a car door into yours and it hits that that uh, side molding and you oh. don't get a dent or a ding, I want you to drive right over here and hand me 150 bucks because it saves you money. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, especially down here in South Florida. South Florida, they, they, they 
right on top of your car at the shopping center. Horrible. Uh, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, can you – I, I am sure you must have a million – Stories. I don't want any customer names, but can you share with me one of the craziest experiences you had with a service customer who wanted to blame you for something and you guys better take care of it? Because I got one for you that'll knock your socks off. Well, we all know that the service writer is supposed to walk around the car yes. at the time of write up, still today. Yes. Because yes. we know, we know not not every customer is honest. Not everyone. This car, this car comes in, and the service rider was actually seasoned. Was not a new service rider. Yeah. Was in a was in a rush because he has ten cars to write up. Yeah. Everyone's in a hurry. The the courtesy bus driver has to leave, and what happens? Ah, we'll just forget that. Write up all the cars, put them in the shop. Car goes in the shop, and my shop foreman comes to me and says, "David, did you did you talk to your service writer about this car being keyed?" I said, "No. What do you mean? This car, the whole passenger side, is keyed, and you can clearly see the rust coming off yeah. the paint. So it's not new." Yes. So I go. So I says. Let me go out. So I went out, looked at it, and the whole side was keyed. I go pull the repair order, which is the hard copy, which to the audience, the hard copy is the copy that the technician touches, signs it, and carries with him. It's usually a yes. piece of thicker, thicker paper. There's nothing on there about any key scratches, not one item. Oh, now we got a big problem. Yes. I go to the, I go to the service writer. The service writer says, well, I was in a rush. I was busy. What am I supposed to do? I know he's busy. So I had to get the whole car paint. It cost us $1,800 internal. Oh, my because goodness. Of, because of a stupid error. Now, yes, we could have fought it. I, you can see it's not new. We're going to yeah. lose a customer. We're going to lose a customer. They're going to tell their family not to buy a car from us. They're going to go on social media, which wasn't that big back then. Yes. But there was America Online. I'm sure you remember that. I do, oh, yes. Don't buy a car from so-and-so because they, <laughs> they did this to me. It was my decision to charge service for it, get the car fixed, somewhat make the customer happy. And that customer still today still came back and did their service with us. What would happen if I said no? We would have lost. You'd never, yeah. Correct. You'd, you'd, so, you'd never see right. that customer again. Right. So, uh, you know, sometimes you have to make managerial decisions that benefits the dealer, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, it's what you have to do. It's part and parcel of what you have to do. Now, right. I know on our campus in North Scottsdale, where Acura was, um, right. we had, I think, 11 stores. And one of them was a Porsche store. So a Porsche customer who had recently got his car comes in right. uh, for like a, a thousand mile service and uh, the front bumper's damaged. And he says to the service writer, he said, I just want you to know that, yeah, I, I hit something. I haven't gotten my survey from Porsche yet. Oh. If you'd like to get a good, good survey, you'll you'll take care of that front bumper for me. Yeah. So the service writer went to this to the uh, general manager, and this is a Penske store. And you, huh? you, one thing Mr. Penske doesn't want is upset customers. Absolutely, still today, still today. Yes, um, and and so they replaced the bumper cover for him. Um, so that they could get a good survey, um, you know, and, and did, did they have to no. no, was, was the customer being a little bit of a pig? Yes. yes. Um, yeah. but in the long run, 
you know, it, it was okay because you know I I don't want to talk out of school, but at that time they were probably averaging eight thousand dollars gross profit per new Porsche sold. Um, right. You know, you're selling a hundred of them a month. Right. I guess you can afford the one bumper cover. Right. You know. And let and and who paid for that repair? Um, the new car department actually paid for it because they were the one that needed the good survey. <laughs> cost cost to sale, huh? Yeah, absolutely. It's what you do. It's what you have to do. You know, I at at, at the Acura store, I empowered every one of my salespeople that if there were problems or issues that their customers ever came back with, that they had $500 per month carte blanche that they could use to to make sure that their customers were happy. Now, I also told them that if, if during the course of the sale you promised them, I don't know, all weather mats, but you told them to come get it after the fact, that that doesn't fly. What flies is if there's an issue, you can spend up to $500 to address it. You don't have to clear it through me. You don't have to clear it through anybody. I had eight salespeople. That meant there was $4,000 a month waiting to be spent. And when I, when I did that for the salespeople, if we spent five hundred dollars a month, we spent a lot. But the oh. fact that they that they knew they could take care of an issue that their customer had, and that the customer didn't have to go through all kinds of BS to get it handled, oh. it it made the customer more loyal. It made the salespeople more loyal Correct. because Correct. they they weren't getting that anywhere else. No, it, just like touch up paint, I. You know, you know that even though half of the people don't use it. Yes. I mean, really, with twenty dollars, is going to hurt the department that much. No. Uh, no. So I automatically sent out touch of paint for every customer. They didn't even know they were getting it. Yep. You know, there's there's a program for every manufacturer that 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 has. It, it's the little things that you, as a dealer, have to do to keep your customers happy. And, and, you know, if you're, if you sell uh, a thousand new cars a year at $20 a car, that adds up, but I get it, but, but on a per car basis, it's nothing. And, Uh. and as I used to, when, when we would have issues and we would take care of them and somebody would say to me, well, aren't you worried how that's going to impact the bottom line? And I go, if if that five hundred dollars is going to be the difference between us being profitable or not profitable for the year, then uh, I screwed up long before this five hundred dollars. Uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, 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 it it's taking care of the customer. Yeah, it's going to cost. So, listen, nothing's for free. It's going to cost yeah. everyone. You know. You know, some people in other departments don't realize that parts inventories that can be eight, nine, ten grand a year for parts inventory. Yeah. Who pays for that? It comes out of the parts profit. The bottom yes. line. The the dealer principal is not going to pay for it. You know that. Yes. You know, some people don't know these dealer fees that these dealers charge a thousand dollars for. Even if they lose four grand on the car that dealer principal gets paid first. Yes, absolutely. So, absolutely. And, and, and I must say in your state of Florida, horrible. You, you guys have some of the most outrageous yeah. dealer dock fees and yeah. other fees that yeah. I have ever encountered yeah. in my time in the industry. It, it is like, yeah. There's no constraints on some of these dealers where they, you know, nine hundred ninety-five dollar dock fee, fourteen hundred ninety-five dollar dock fee. Um, there was one Zach and I did a video a couple of years ago where it was it was a nineteen hundred ninety-five dollar friends and family fee. You know, yeah, we are, we we know what that is, right? Friends and family fee. 
<laughs> yeah, well, it's paying for the dealer's yacht. Yeah, but correct. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's like, how does somebody... I would just, it, it, it's, it's, it's stupidious. I just had lunch with Jeff Weisner. You know who he is. He did an yes, interview with I know, him. we know yeah. Jeff. We've interviewed yeah. him a few times. Yeah. His sister is a good friend of mine, so I have very okay. good friends with, um, with Jeff. And these dealerships down here in Florida were so greedy. I saw addendums for twenty grand on a Kia Telluride. You and me know we're in the auto industry. I wouldn't pay two cents over. And 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 what these people today don't understand these dealership employees I'm talking about, not the customer. Yes, yes the customer was stupid. These yes. dealerships have tarnished their reputation in the next three Forever. to four years now. Yes. That these customers are going to die in that car that they're in. They're, they're never going to come, you know, at, at one day, every one of those customers wakes up and says, I paid an extra 20 grand for what? Just, yeah. just to have the ability to buy it? They paid no, for Mr. They paid for Mr. So-and-so's yacht, his yes. $6 million home, and everything else. And, and, and you know, the worst part is that as the salesperson, typically, you don't necessarily get to participate in that no. additional DR markup. I, I, I'm not going to mention any names down here, but yes. there are several. Yeah. Uh, More than Auto Group has taken over South Florida here now. Okay. A lot. Um, they just bought out Al Hamilton Toyota. I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. They own the they own the Arigos. Um, Lithia Motors is becoming very big down in South Florida. So you know the 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 experience of you and me working for a privately owned dealer back in the days is gone. Yes, I have worked for mom and pop organizations. Yeah. I have yeah. worked for Fortune Five because you know I was with the Penske organization for yeah, right. uh, ten and a half years. Um, I've been with some fairly decent sized, um, smaller private organizations. Right. Um, but th the most important thing that I learned is that if philosophically the the owner and I couldn't agree on how you handle customers, then that wasn't, that wasn't a good fit for me. It, right. it just wasn't. Um, right. And, and that I should avoid those type of stores. I either, because there has to be that you have to agree about how you want to handle customers. Right. You know, right. At, at least that that's been my experience. Did you micromanage your customer, your, your employees? Um, I tried not to. And, and the reason I say that, and, and it used to drive some of them crazy and right. it used to drive me crazy. Right. <clears throat> but I used to, I used to tell them in, a, in the sales meetings or when we had private one-on-ones, mm -hmm. if, if you need me to double check that you're doing your work, then I made a mistake when I hired you. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And and there were I I remember salespeople that I had hired that had been at my competitor. And at that store, they were micromanaged. And then they came to our store where they weren't. And they floundered. And one of the reasons they floundered is they didn't know how to handle their freedom and still get their work done. That's which was that's disappointing. Um, yeah, um, it's just some people need that. I didn't want to have to manage like that. I, I right. tried, I tried to manage in such a way that I would give the salespeople the authority to just go ahead and make deals. I would say, okay, you can discount up to, right. if you got to right. discount more than that, then you have to come to the desk and we'll figure it right. out. But right. I want I want the customer to be able to realize that they're dealing with the decision maker. Correct. And not so the manager. I, I, right. Exactly. Yes. I right. so I tried to empower salespeople 
Um, and I had some that were really good at it. And then oh. I had others that just that just needed to have somebody stay on their ass all day long saying, did you follow up with so-and-so? Did you give so-and-so a call? Have you made your 10 phone call? Have... Man, why do I, I, what do I need you for if I'm doing all that? I want the damn commission when we sell the car. Listen, I just bought two EVs as I put in my email. Okay. Because we're getting ready. We're, we're moving there quick. Yes. Maybe not in sales lately. And I still haven't gotten a phone call thanking me. Can you believe wow. that? No. No. And, and I, I could never understand why a salesperson would not want to call their customer and thank them for having purchased the vehicle. They didn't have to buy it from you. Well, I, I mean, I have friends everywhere. You know that just like you. I know you do. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, it, it amazes me. No email or nothing. Wow. It is. It, it's astounding it, sometimes. And, and it, 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 another thing is that I, I don't, the audience should know that, you know, let's say your, your car has a three or 36,000 mile warranty by yes. the factory. Yes. A, you have to maintain the vehicle. Yes. B, it doesn't mean everything's under warranty. If you don't maintain your vehicle, the factories, I'm the factory. I'm not going to warranty it. They yes. can call whoever they want up the chain. I will stand behind my customer if they destroy their car. Why should the factory pay for that? Yes. And so, it, it, so where I'm getting to this is if a customer is religiously bringing their vehicle into your service department and they spend $100 every three months, you know, that's money, may not yes. be a lot. Then when their car is out of warranty, I have the authority to goodwill parts and service up to two years or 24,000 miles for a customer that retains their value to us as a dealer. Yes. And, yes. I, and, I, will, and I will do it. Absolutely. I, I am so glad you brought that up because, you know, as, as you know, dealerships and a lot of them get get bad press because, well, they deserve it. But right. one of the things that good dealerships do, if if you bring your car in for service with them, if after your warranty is expired, either due to time or miles, that they can put in a good word on your behalf with their mm -hmm. factory service representative to get things covered for you that ordinarily would not be. Right. And there's value in that. I mean, because, you know, you've heard it. Lots of customers will say, well, I'll buy the car from that new car dealership, but right. I'm never taking my car in for service there. They're just right. going to rip me off. Well, what most people don't realize is that most dealerships price their work competitive to what the independent shops charge every one. month every month exactly compare. yes and then like like we just said if there's an issue after the warranty they will stand by your side to help get that covered now if you never go into the dealership after you've bought the car they're not going to do that for you it, it would depend if they, it, it, you know, if they bought 10 cars a year out of me, are you really going to fight for? Uh, yeah, but but if, if it's the first car they ever bought from you yeah. and they bought it from you 42 months ago and they've yeah. never come back to your store for service for anything, not I'm even warranty stuff. work. No. Yeah, you're, you're not going to, no. you're not going to go out. I, I remember when I was at an Acura dealership in Laurel, mm. Maryland, and we had people come in and they had a TL and it had a transmission issue and it had 80 some thousand miles on it. And I said, let me just talk to my factory service rep and see if there's anything I can get them to do. And, and uh, these people had service records for everything. And because they had the service records, I got the factory to pay for half of the repair. 
Well, these 50, 50, folks were yeah. Yes, yeah. for something that was no longer under warranty, well past right. the warranty stage. Right. And these people were so thankful mm -hmm. that that we went out of our way to try and help them. Um, right. And that's some of the value that dealerships can bring that right. customers don't often think about. Just, and just also, throw it out there, folks. Yeah, that customer... <laughs> may come buy another car and trade that car to you. Oh, and absolutely. You're not stuck, and you're not going to lose your rear end at the auction on it. Exactly. Exactly. Well, so, Dave, I, I, you, you might find this hard to believe. We've crushed an hour, my friend. I know. I know. We have, I we have literally crushed an hour. Um, and, and I can't thank you enough for spending the time with me. I, I hope the audience has a, um, a greater understanding and an appreciation of how the entire dealership operation works after you and I having had this conversation. I hope, and I hope to be invited back. There's more. Um, uh, yeah, no, absolutely, because we could probably talk for another three or four hours. <laughs> absolutely. Appreciate it. appreciate it very much. I do support you, you and Zach. And, I know you uh, do. And, and I really appreciate it. Well, I, I, I appreciate it more. I want to wish you the happiest of holidays. Um, um, and I do look forward to continuing our conversation. I promise you we will have another. All right. All right. Thank you. Have a good holiday.